Welcome to the Home Production Echo Series. My name is Andrea Hevler, and I will be helping with the facilitation today. First off, thank you to all of you for being here and participating in this Home Production Series. Um, today, we're going to be talking about how to prevent infectious diseases, I'm sorry, uh, with injected, injectable drugs. And we're going to have Chris Eber discussing this important topic with us. But before we start, I want to remind all of you that these sessions are being recorded for later distribution. However, the information that you see on the chat will not be shared during the recording. So please, if possible, let's start adding our names, email addresses, affiliations on the chat. Remember, this information will be used to confirm your attendance to this class, especially if you're seeking CMEs or if you're joining us today via phone, please send us an email and let us know that you were here. As always, there is no personal health information to be shared during this conversation, whether on the chat or verbally, to protect, of course, the identity of the person we are discussing. That means no information that could lead us or give us a clue of who the person is. Um, wanted to remind you also that it's very important to take the time to answer our post-session survey. The survey only takes two or three minutes and will give us ideas on topics or areas in which you particularly feel that you need a little bit more of information or support from this community. And without waiting too much, let's move to introductions. We're going to start with our presenter of the day, Chris Abert. Could you introduce yourself to the group, please? Sure. Hi, everybody. Uh, Christopher Abert. I'm with Southwest Recovery Alliance. Um, we are a harm reduction organization. Uh, I'm also the co-chair of the Hepatitis Elimination Plan in Arizona. Uh, and I've worked with National Viral Hepatitis Roundtable and the National Harm Reduction Coalition throughout the years. Thank you, Chris. And our case presenter of the day, James Tapscott. Hi, I'm James Tapscott, work for Recovery Resource Council up here in Fort Worth. I'm a recovery support peer specialist and peer specialist supervisor. Thank you for being here, James. Uh, we don't have some of the hop here, but we have Shreya. Prasanna, Shreya, could you introduce yourself? Now you can you can take over the facilitation, Ms. Shreya. <laughs> no, I'll let you continue. Um, <laughs> my name is Shreya Prasanna, and I am uh, I work with UT Health San Antonio ECHO program. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for being here. And let's start with the presentation. Some of our hub members are not with us today, unfortunately, but that might give us a little bit more time to discuss more on the didactics and on the second part of this session, and that is the case discussion. Chris, whenever you're ready, we can start with your presentation. Great. Let me just take control of the screen. Yes. All right. Well, that is not the right slide. Peaceful. Oh, that's the right slide. All right. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, it's really good to be here. Oh, yeah, stuff falling all over the place here. It's really good to be here today. And um, <clears throat> we are going to talk about opportunities to prevent uh, the transmission of infectious disease. And, in back, and serious bacterial infections uh, among people who use drugs. I feel like a lot of times, excuse me, when these presentations are given, uh, there's a lot of focus on, on charts and graphs and, and rates. And I'm gonna blast through those really quick so I can get to what I think is actually really important. I want everyone on this, um, watching this didactic, to understand the actual process that people on the streets are going through when they're injecting. And then we can identify points of intervention all along that process. Uh, so I've got some displays and, and we'll do that. So if I if you hear me blasting through these stats, they're all readily available. You can get these anywhere. So yeah, disclosure, there are no relevant financial. That's me. 
Um, there's some of the terms that we use, uh, SSP, birth syringe service program, IDU for injection drug use. I'm sure most of us are familiar with these. Um, I'm actually not sure if CBAMS is in this presentation. I think I just left that on there by accident. Uh, but if we have time, we'll talk about it. <clears throat> so I would love for people to be able to identify some of the diseases associated with injection drug use. I'm sure most of us can. Uh, I'd love for people to be able to describe risk, risk factors. Uh, that's what we're going to focus on the most. Um, again, identifying those opportunities for intervention along the process of, of that injection. Uh, ex and then ex take that information we have and be able to explain to injection drug users how they can avoid disease transmission and a bacterial infection. Uh, and then we'll see if that comparison's at the end. Um, so as we know, hepatitis C, hepatitis B, hepatitis A, all these bacterial infections. I got to move my little, uh, all these bacterial infections. Um, I think prior to COVID, hepatitis C was the number one infectious killer uh, in the country. I don't know if everybody knew that either. It's crazy. It killed more people than uh, tuberculosis. It killed more people than the next 62 infectious diseases combined, right? And and, and it's, I, I feel like there's no... Uh, <laughs> We should know that there should be a national emergency uh, and, and we should be treating people. Uh, but thank goodness uh, we're in a much better position to treat people in Texas recently uh, with some of the restrictions uh, being removed and the availability of direct acting antivirals. Um, <clears throat> so hepatitis C is on the rise, particularly it's on the rise among um among people uh, in their 20s and 30s. Uh, and this is Concerning not just for them, but also those folks who are of childbearing age. Uh, so while transmission of hep C through pregnancy is very low, uh, we want to make sure that everything can go as smoothly as possible. Um, and then of course, uh, HIV, oops. Uh, HIV, uh, there is a national um, hepatitis and a and he hepatitis and HIV uh, elimination plan. Uh, as I said, I'm part of the Arizona Hepatitis C Elimination Plan. Um, we're not going to get rid of HIV or Hepatitis C until we address injection drug use, uh, and and that is because nine percent of new HIV cases uh, and sixty five percent or more of HCV cases are directly tied to folks not having access to sterile supplies. Um, the vast majority of people who inject drugs will get hepatitis C after five years. So here's an opportunity for us to open up conversation. If the vast amount of people who use inter intravenous drugs get hepatitis C and somebody comes into you and says, I've been using IV drugs for 10 years and I don't have hep C, what a wonderful opportunity to ask them questions about how they manage that and then take that information and share it with other folks so that they can also avoid uh, hepatitis C. All these are avoidable. Uh, and then over on the right-hand side, there's the lifetime cost of each HIV infection being well over $380,000. I've also heard $425,000. Uh, <clears throat> Scott County, Indiana, that's where I, I was living about an hour from there, the largest HIV outbreak in the history of the country. Uh, and um, 231 people in a, in a town of 4,000. So picture in your mind a town of 4,000 people and then 231 of them living with HIV uh, from injection drug use. Uh, it's, it's insane, it's mind blowing, and it changed the landscape. Uh, so then Governor Mike Pence approved uh, syringe service programs. Uh, and as soon as those were implemented, um, the cases of HIV uh, went down. Um, yeah, and it's money saving. So some things that you might not, actually, before we get into this, I'm going to just pull up some of these uh, items that I have in front of me, and we're going to go through uh, the actual process of what it looks like for a person who's injecting drugs uh, in a street-based setting. Um, so usually, and I, I want what I want everyone to do is step-by-step step, as I'm doing this, I want you to think about disease and bacterial transmission, okay? So the first thing that's gonna happen is they're gonna pull up their, put this in front of my shirt so you can see it. There you go. Uh, they're gonna pull up their little baggie. This is just a dirty little baggie. I actually ripped it off the side of a, of a thing. 
But what you should know is this baggie was probably in somebody's mouth. Yeah, it could have been stuck in somebody's pants. Uh, it's been handled by a bunch of fingers. Uh, so just this baggie is probably covered in bacteria. Uh, but they're going to take their baggie. They're going to open it up. Uh, usually they'll use. There we go. Usually they'll use a spoon. Uh, so they'll take it and they'll put it in the spoon. Um, and obviously the spoon is not sterile. Um, and when they put it in here, they will then set it down <clears throat> and they'll grab their syringe. We're assuming that they have a sterile syringe. Take off the back, take off the front. Grab one up. Oh man, everything's invisible with that background. <laughs> uh, grab a uh, we see grab it. water. <laughs> Uh, and then you'll draw up some of the water. Woo, I gotta be careful with this. I might take my background off in just a second. So they, they draw up the water, they check for air bubbles. Again, we tell people you, you would you would need a lot more air bubbles than this uh, insulin syringe can hold. Um, so the drugs are in the spoon and I have the syringe and then I'm gonna put the water in there. Um, so. The drugs are likely adulterated. <clears throat> so we're going to use a piece of cotton. And again, think about all the points. The reason I'm showing you this right now is so you can identify points of intervention. So I'm going to, typically it's used, a uh, piece of cotton is used to filter. So I have this tiny piece of cotton. Oh, my nails are done from Thanksgiving. By If you like those, uh, Bella Lagosa doing your presentation today. Uh, so... <clears throat> I got this little piece of cotton and I put it in here. And again, I want you to think about my fingers on this cotton. Oftentimes people won't have a piece of cotton. Uh, so they'll pull it off of a cotton ball uh, or pull it out of the back of a cigarette. And clearly that is not sterile. Uh, so you, you're not gonna be able to see this, but I'll put the syringe point <clears throat> onto the cotton, you know, which was just in my hands. And I have this spoon, which did not go through an autoclave or get cleaned in any way. And I, through the cotton, I'll draw up uh, the liquid. Sometimes if it's not broken down, I'll take the other end of the syringe and, and do this. But again, my fingers were all over this. Now it's all in here. Sometimes people will put it in their mouth to, to right? And then put it back in. <laughs> okay, so I draw it up. Uh, and then I'll lift my, I'm not actually going to inject this water because it's not clean, as you can see. I would lift up, I would, <clears throat> please hold. All right. Uh, I'd lift up and I would go to inject. <clears throat> Again, I'm not going to inject, but once I registered a vein, I draw back to make sure it's registered. Uh, and then I'm going to. Uh, inject the drug. I take it out. I still have the syringe. Um, sometimes I'll pick up that water and I'll pull it back up. And I'm just going to rinse out whatever blood is in there. And sometimes people will do it into their mouth. I'm just going to rinse it a couple of times, uh, put the cap back on it. Uh, and the injection process is complete. Sometimes I want, might not be able to find a vein, so I'll use a belt, uh, tie a belt around to be able to expand the vein. All right. So now we're going to go through and talk about all the points of intervention uh, that I'm aware of, and you can bring up some as well. Um, so the first one is the syringe, right? Is it a sterile syringe? And it's important to remember that HIV can survive inside the syringe. On the outside, not so much. Uh, inside the syringe, it can survive up to 42 days. Hepatitis C can survive inside a used syringe up to 63 days. So if I haven't rinsed the syringe, uh, or if it's been used by somebody who has hepatitis C or HIV, uh, there is a, a high risk of transmission of those diseases. Now, here's the thing. Obviously, a sterile syringe, uh, you're not going to have any of those um, any of those risks, right? So a sterile syringe would be top-line uh, defense against inter uh, intervening in the transmission of these diseases. But even rinsing one or two times with just water can reduce risk by up to 90%, right? And then if you add something like bleach, that can reduce risk. 
Here's the thing. Bleach is not going to kill everything all the time. Rinsing with water obviously isn't going to kill everything every time, but it at least minimizes the risk in lieu of having uh, the gold standard, right, which is a sterile syringe for every injection. Um, there are there are options to try to stay safe. Uh, so uh, drawing up bleach, <clears throat> pushing it out, uh, and then doing that three times, and then doing it three times with the water. <clears throat> so yeah, uh, people don't realize, I think, how long HIV and hepatitis C can be viable inside a syringe. So again, the gold standard would be a new syringe for every injection incident. Uh, that is a surefire way to avoid the transmission of disease, at least associated with used syringes. Uh, and then cleaning previously used equipment and syringes um, if, if there isn't sterile equipment available. As I said, bleach has been found to kill hepatitis C in syringes. Uh, and you wanna make sure that the solution at least has one part of bleach to 10 parts of water for two minutes. Um, and then boiling and burning and using common cleaning fluids also uh, can be effective. Again, this is dangerous though, uh, because if people don't rinse it out enough, uh, then they could be in danger of uh, accidentally injecting uh, household goods. I think another thing people don't realize is that hepatitis C can survive on the surface uh, for up to six weeks. So if I have this spoon and I haven't washed it and I haven't washed it well enough, and there's dried blood on there or dried remnant of hepatitis C up to six weeks old, uh, then this spoon, I can still transmit hepatitis C or on the tip of the syringe, on the outside of the syringe. Or if I didn't have a cotton and I was using somebody else's cotton, 62 days, the hepatitis C is still viable within those cottons. Or if I use the belt and there's hepatitis C blood on the belt and it gets close to the cut, right, or my injection site, I could transmit hepatitis C. <clears throat> or if I'm smoking uh, and I share a pipe with someone and we both have cuts, anytime there's blood to blood or dried blood to blood, uh, there's a possibility of hepatitis C transmission. Uh, this is a, a, a well-known place in where I'm living right now. Uh, and it shows the conditions under which people are injecting. So clearly this is not sanitary. Uh, I think we can all imagine what is in that corner with those syringes. <clears throat> One of the things we tell people, so we went through the process of me injecting and what you noticed is I didn't wash my hands uh, before I did the injection, right? So something as simple as hand washing can cut down uh, disease and bacterial infections. If I couple it with an alcohol light, right? So if I would have washed my hands and then if I knew how to do the alcohol wipe, right? In a, in a circle, going out, <clears throat> I can cut down on 90% of bacterial infections just by washing my hands and using an alcohol pad, right? There's, it's, it's, it's so readily available. And I'm telling you now that I uh, injected drugs for over 20 years, and I can't remember a single time that I washed my hands. And I wish someone honestly would have given me the advice because I did have opportunities sometimes. So we can stop bacterial infections, abscesses, even like endocarditis. Most of the infections that happen from injection drug use are just from bacteria that's right on your arm at the point of injection, and we can knock that out. Now, that's not everything. There can be, you know, um, in the drugs themselves, there can be contaminants. <clears throat> but we don't think, it's a, what a nice point of intervention. Hey, wash your hands. <clears throat> uh, again, rather than people using cigarette butts, um, oftentimes people will hand out these little baggies with cottons in them. Hello? Are... Hello? Yeah, I'm here. Yes. Hi, Lakeisha. Who you call? Hey, Lakeisha, you're off mute. I'm sorry. I wasn't supposed to be. Sorry about that. Guys. That's okay. Oh, you're right. Um, okay, so uh, we have these little dental cottons, uh, also semi-sterile cotton balls, uh, and those can be given out in lieu of cigarette butts. <clears throat> and instead of cookers, sometimes uh, around the country, they'll give out these little bottle caps. And these are sterile, they're cheap. They're actually bottle caps. They just haven't been pressed yet with the with the ridges. So it's just a sterile aluminum body bottle cap. Uh, and you can throw it out as soon as you're done. The same with if you have a bunch of cottons, 
uh, you can just throw those out as you go. Then you don't have to worry about someone using it again and getting hepatitis C. You don't have to worry about whatever or whatever could be growing. It's like a little Petri dish in there of, of nastiness. And uh, you don't have to worry about that. If, you're, if you have enough, then you can just throw them away and do a single use. Uh, I don't know if anybody thought, hey, that water's not very clean looking. <laughs> but that's another point of intervention, right? So this water uh, was actually from the tap, so it was probably fine. But after I did my shot, do you remember I put my syringe back in there to rinse it? If I have hepatitis C, which I did, as soon as I put my syringe in that water, this all this water has the possibility of having hepatitis C. So if somebody else uses this same water, uh, then they are at risk from hepatitis C transmission. So we can use these little nebulizers. They're little packets of water uh, that are usually for nebulizers. You take the top off. Uh, and that way, in instances where someone's experiencing homelessness, uh, there's safe, safer options. Uh, and as I mentioned before, something as simple as a tourniquet, not just for good vein health, but also because when that belt was there and there's blood on the belt, because I've used it so many times and we're sharing the belt, there's a possibility of hepatitis C uh, transmission. <clears throat> Obviously, since we're giving things out, uh, we can give people condoms and lube. This is particularly important uh, for men and for sex workers who are using stimulants. Uh, we want to make sure uh, that they are as safe as they can possibly be. Um, there's a whole training on uh, what's called chemsex or party and play and sex work and, uh, and drugs, because it could be a drug like a stimulant uh, that allows you to perform sexual acts for much longer than it normally uh, uh, is normally possible. Uh, and it could be, um, there are lots of, of reasons to, to give out the lube and the, and the condoms to folks. Um, another thing that we hear uh, across the country is people giving out straws. Uh, so again, if I'm sharing a straw and I have hepatitis and there's blood in my nose, that's a point of transmission. Uh, the bacteria that's on like dollar bills that are often used um, can get into open cuts uh, and cause problems. Uh, sometimes programs will give out colored straws. Uh, oh, I don't have any. Uh, so that everybody knows what their co the color of the straw is. <clears throat> and as I mentioned, um, not only are pipes given out to prevent the transmission of disease like hepatitis, COVID, the flu, uh, a variety of others uh, from the mouth to mouth, <clears throat> but it's also an incentive for people to stop injecting. Uh, so obviously a point of intervention in disease transmission for injection drug users would be to get them to stop injecting. Uh, and if they're not in a place where they can stop drug use totally, then we can uh, offer alternatives. So whether that's oral ingestion or suppositories uh, or pipes, and that is a way to cut down on the transmission of disease. I think this is important. Uh, and these all these tools are available through syringe service programs. Um, syringe service programs are Part of the CDC's strategy to prevent opioid overdoses. They're part of the, as I mentioned before, HIV and AIDS elimination strategies, part of the National Hepatitis Plan, and part of SAMHSA's opioid overdose uh, toolkit. So they're important not just for um, getting having access to these supplies, it's important for the reduce the transmission disease, uh, but also for um, overdose. <laughs> Sorry, I gotta see if I can. Oh. Okay, so this is, we were, <clears throat> I'm glad this is here. This is the last slide. Oftentimes, um, I will hear as a provider uh, that a syringe service program is helping people who are using drugs uh, to avoid the transmission of disease. But they'll say, uh, there are syringes in the playground. So you're helping people who use drugs avoid HIV, and at the same time, you're putting kids at danger because those are then improperly disposed. So I want to dispel this myth, and I want everyone on this call at least to know there's never in the history of Earth, in the history of, of all time, been a case of transmission of HIV uh, from a community-based accidental needle stick. Does it happen in health settings? Yeah, it's 3 to 5% possibility in a health setting that a nurse accidentally sticks themselves uh, and might. In the community, the conditions for transmission uh, make it practically negligible. And I'm taking that uh, practically negligible uh, from a, a journal, from a medical journal. I have the 
the data to back this too. Uh, also in the United States, there's never been a case of hepatitis C transmission from a community-based accidental needle stick, right? So this is really important. If we are fearful of syringes being in the community, and then we, we close down syringe service programs, which happened uh, in Southern Indiana in the same place where the HIV outbreak happened, um, just need to keep in mind that there's actually not uh, a real and present danger for that. And there is a real and present danger when folks who are injecting don't have access to sterile supplies. Oh. <clears throat> so we have a, there's a, a little pamphlet we have about what to do if you find a syringe in the, in the neighborhood. Of course, this is Arizona specific, uh, but I'm sure Texas has similar policies. Uh, and I think I'll end with that. Uh, sometimes we talk about uh, diseases associated with injection drug use, and for sure they're associated with injection drug use, but really they're associated with not having access to sterile equipment and not having uh, education uh, about how to stay safe. So folks that we are working with are struggling with substance use disorder. Uh, relapse is part of substance use disorder. Return to use is part of substance use disorder. And we wanna keep people safe wherever they are on their journey. Uh, and this is a wonderful way to make sure that <clears throat> wherever they are in their journey and whenever they, uh, whatever their journey leads them, uh, that they don't end that journey with um, avoidable HIV or avoidable hepatitis C, uh, and clearly with avoidable fatal overdose. Uh, dead people will never recover. Even if they never recover at all, it's just good public health policy to try to help people who are using drugs to avoid the transmission of disease. And that is your introduction to injection drug use uh, with a demonstration to show you points of intervention. And what I really hope can happen out of this is that maybe you picked up on one little thing and you're working with a client uh, and you know they're just not to a point where you, you're finding much positive change to celebrate with them. And you can say, <clears throat> you know, if you're sharing, if you're using the same water to draw up when you inject, uh, there might be hepatitis C in that if you rinsed in it right? Something as small as that can build your rapport and stop the spread of disease. You could say, you know, Q-tips are a more viable option than the back of a cigarette filter. You might say, you know, you can bleach the spoon uh, before each use. You might say, did you know you can use an alcohol pad and demonstrate how to use it, right? Uh, and, and reduce like 90% of the bacterial infections uh, that people have. Uh, I didn't even talk about I'm not going to talk about them. That's enough. That's a lot of information. Y'all are going to go out of here with a lot of information and you can share it. And something as simple as don't draw up out of the toilet bowl, draw up out of the back of the toilet basin, right? These little nonchalant, non-judgmental things really pierce into the heart of people who are struggling and they feel seen and they will trust you and you are helping them. And I love that so much about harm reduction. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. Great presentation. Uh, I would like to open the floor uh, for our participants to give their impressions, opinions, ideas about this presentation. I think we haven't had such a thought of detailed presentation like we had today. So any thoughts? Yeah, I just had a quick one. Um, thanks for all this information, Chris. Um, was just wondering because I know xylazine isn't, you know, as prevalent as it is in like the Northeast. Um, so if there's any like additional considerations with, you know, just safer use education in general, because I know kind of pre, you know, pre xylazine, you know. A lot of it was focused on if people could, you know, switch from, say, injecting to snorting or smoking, less risk. But then with xylazine, I know at least in the Northeast, um, we started seeing even with people who had switched their route of use to smoking or <laughs> snorting, they were still having complicate like complications with like, you know, the, like black mucus discharge, 
um, a cough that wouldn't go away. Yeah, so I mean, there's, uh, you know, this is a xylosine test strip uh, and they are not available right now in Texas. Uh, other parts of the country are using these to at least let the person know if there's xylosine present. Uh, the same with the fentanyl test strips. <clears throat> I mean, the 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 uh, gold standard solution for that obviously would be uh, not to have an adulterated drug supply. Um, second in line with that would be to use mass spectrometers and FTIRs to find quantity and quality of what's in the drug. Uh, third best would be a, a simple strip like this. Fourth best would be education about what those xylosine wounds look like uh, and how to treat them. Uh, fifth would be making sure people understand the difference in um, a xylosine and opioid overdose and just an opioid overdose. So there's there's a, a ton of options to try to keep people as safe as possible given xylosine adulteration and the drug supply. Um, but yeah, it's it's going to be harm reduction. Do you know? Uh, different places in different parts of the country are at different place at different spaces in this, uh, and even with um, even with anything short of unadulterated uh, supply, uh, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna have continued uh, detrimental impacts to people's lives. Um, so, I I just keep trying to get folks to educate as much as possible so we can minimize. Again, we don't have time to do a whole xylosine presentation, but again, just knowing the wounds, knowing to use like zero form uh, rather than any kind of sticky gauze, uh, knowing how long to keep it on, knowing to tell people to not pick at the white goo in the uh, in the wound, because that's actually skin, uh, telling people not to use peroxide. That's probably the most common thing we get is people are cleaning their wounds every day with peroxide. And I'm just like, oh, so if I can, again, just give them saline, these little salines, uh, and give them some zero form and give them some compression bands uh, and tell them I love them <laughs> and and continue to give them the supplies they need. Because the last thing is folks have been traumatized in the medical system and they're a remiss to go in to the ER and be honest about what's going on with them. So I don't know if that answered your question, but I know there are at least six suggestions that we could do as a as a whole and a bunch of education we could do individually one-on-one. -on -one. Yes, Chris, I see here a comment. The amount of time the virus can live was shocking. I guess yeah. I was shocked by that too. Yeah, I didn't know that about this. Uh, the six weeks outside of the body with hepatitis C. Uh, that's actually pretty, I think that's pretty recent uh, data that came out. Um, so yeah, we have, to, we have to be really careful. And I see here, Maddie Honey is fantastic for healing, but not usually practical for unhoused folks. That's what I was gonna, that's what I was gonna say. Yeah, that unfortunately the honey uh, attracts, um, attracts bugs. <laughs> The tracks bugs and and uh, and it can get real unclean. <clears throat> Another thing that we we try to do personally, and I'm not giving medical advice. I'm not a doctor, uh, <clears throat> but we were advised by our medical director uh, that oftentimes we'll give out antibiotic ointment, and if we're doing that with unhoused housed folks, uh, there's a good chance they're not going to be able to use that antibiotic ointment regularly on their wounds, and so there might be. Uh, uh, resistant bacteria that comes out of that or resistant infections that come out of that. So it's better for us as harm reduction people to give out petroleum jelly without the antibiotic. That way, if it turns really bad and they go into the hospital, uh, they've not had any antibiotics anywhere near it. Uh, so the antibiotics they will get from the hospital will be more effective, right? Again, we could, we could do four-year degrees <laughs> on all of the information that's available to try to keep uh, people safe in the current environment. Wonderful. Yeah, and actually, I can, yes. I can share my uh, contact information. Yes, I wanted to that to ask you that. And also they're asking if there are any links or resources that you can provide with some of the practices that we just saw, that we just discussed today. Well, the slide deck's available, right? And it will go out. Yes. Uh, yeah, the slide deck's available. Um, I think Next Distro, N E X T D I S T R O, uh, probably has the most comprehensive uh, harm reduction library uh, of any website. Uh, and then obviously the National Harm Reduction Coalition. Um, 
if you're thinking about xylazine, uh, the Philadelphia Department of Public Health uh, has, I think, the most up-to-date uh, information about xylazine wounds. Um, so those are some some options uh, that are available to everybody. All right, thank you. So in the interest of time, we're going to move to the announcements, and then we're going to move to our case presentation. And hopefully, we'll try to connect that case presentation with uh, what we just discussed. So CSTAT is the Center for Substance Use Training and Telementoring. Uh, we have right now eight different uh, a different series that address substance use disorders in different areas. We invite all of you to participate in this program. All you have to do is go to cstat.org and see and register for all our ECHO series. Next. And remember, it's easy to claim your credits for today's session. All you have to do is text ATTEND 1009-5064 to the number that you see on the screen. That's 844-502-1338. I'm sorry, once you text that code, uh, you will receive your certificate of attendance. And next. And this is one of the leading Texas sessions that we'll have before our symposium. It's going to be Dr. Bratberg. And that is Wednesday, November 15. Please go again to our CSTAT website so you can uh, register for this class. Next. Mm -hmm. And of course, our symposium, it's going to take place in Austin this year. It's going to be from February 29 to March 1st. Go to CSTAT to register. Please don't miss it. There's going to be a plethora of great speakers and as that event. Thank you. And of course, next month, we are having Aaron Ferguson discussing how to protect ourselves and how to use some harm reduction practices during the holiday. Don't miss it. That's December the 7th at 12. And James, if you are ready, we probably could start briefly discussing our case. Okay. Hi, I'm James Tapscott, Recovery Resource Council. Um, I have a young lady who, uh, despite being in a MAP program, is continuing to use. She's on a low dose of methadone, I think 80 milligrams, um, but she is still using heroin IV on the weekends. And I'm just wondering, how can I encourage her to use safely because she uses alone? You know, she uses and she uses uh, rather sporadically. She doesn't use every weekend, but uh, she is continuing to use some. Um, she does have family support. She works full time. Her uh, recovery capital score was like 45 out of 50, which is very high. She's a very positive young lady. Um, and she would like to, to fully commit to match services and stop using, but she hasn't gotten into that place. Her goal is to get her child back and have a place of her own. Uh, she does use cannabis on a, you know, semi-regular basis, and she does use the, the opioids on a, you know, semi-regular basis. And she uh, is occasionally involved with 12-step meetings, but because they do not support MAC clients, you know, she feels discouraged about that. Um, she is in counseling. She is uh, has gone to an inpatient substance use treatment program. <clears throat> excuse me, in the past, and she is in MAT services or uh, mutual aid. You know, but again, they don't fully support. You know, because of the the methadone. You know, she's not considered in recovery in her recovery program of choice. So um, she does deal with depression, uh, parental divorce, childhood physical abuse, spousal abuse, 
Uh, she does have an A score of five. Uh, but like I say, she's an incredibly positive young woman. So, and she is on citalopram for depression. She has negative for HIV and uh, HCV. Uh, she has been provided naloxone, uh, provided a education about overdose prevention, offered at H HIV testing. Um, we, you know, I don't know of a place to, to uh, refer for the HCV testing. Um, and she does have safe sex supplies. Uh, she has uh, uh, access to fentanyl testing st uh, strips. Um, she does have ongoing peer support and uh, She's connected to a local harm reduction agency, you know, as far as, you know, uh, she's connected to our agency, which also does harm reduction. And that's about it. If anybody has any suggestions on, on uh, ways to go, thank you for the never use alone hotline. I hadn't thought of that. Yes, That's we see really here in our research. chat the phone number for the never use uh, never used alone. Very useful, of course. I'm sorry, who was going to? I think I interrupted someone. Chris, were you going to say something about the case? Okay. No, I had a clarifying. I think we're doing clarifying questions. Um, what I, I might have missed it. I'm sorry. What was the route of administration? IV. Okay. Can you all hear me? Yes. My name is Emily Ibada. I work um, at Bentoff Hospital in Houston with pregnant and postpartum women who use substances. Um, so one of the things I think kind of piggybacking off like Christopher's presentation, digging into the details of how she uses, et cetera, but then also maybe quantifying how much she uses in each session to see if we could even have conversations about reducing the amount she's using or the frequency on that day. I think that could just be at least a starting point. Um, but it definitely sounds like she needs more support and she seems very isolated from, I think, a community that could support her. Um, and it also sounds like her depression might not be managed well. So I think that, so where we live, there are um, and that's so unfortunate that because of her medicines for opioid use disorder, that that precludes her for getting in a program. I think that's nuts. But I know that in Houston, we have a lot of like outpatient recovery services. So people at least feel connected, even when they live far away in like rural areas. So I think that there's some things that we could even connect with people in different cities, like where you live, James, to make sure she's talking to other women in recovery. So she's at least connected. And then also just talking to her about her depression and exploring that a little bit more. Um, because it sounds like, and that's the other thing I, whenever we talk to patients, I always normalize, like oftentimes I find that patients will use substances because they have trauma or they're trying to forget something or um, they're really feeling anxious. Does any of that sound like something you're coping with? kind of like opening that door a little bit and then um, finding trusted resources in the community. But those are just some thoughts. Well, thank you very much. Okay. Also, uh, can anybody hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I kind of heard in the in the case where she has been going to different uh, NAAA type places and, and not accepted. There, There's a... Uh, a group for med patients of uh, Medicaid assisted treatment recovery only. It's called MARA, Medicaid Assistant Recovery Anonymous. They have their own uh, 12, 12 step program. They have their own traditions and things of that nature. And uh, I can put it in the, in the chat here. They, it's mostly online. So she can go online and uh, be a part of that community. And that may with some of her recovery capital type things. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Sandra, did you have a question? Sandra Hines? No, Wiley did it. 
<laughs> other well, I guess the other one I have is what is her living situation right now? She's staying with her father. So with about a women's sober living home, which I guess if she would need to, you know, agree to stay clean or stay only on the mat, but maybe doing something like that would give her where she's not alone, not isolated, and then the companionship of other women in the house. I think that's a good option when she's ready to stop using entirely. Mm -hmm. Right now, safety is the, the most important thing, I think, mm -hmm. you know, until she reaches that point. Yeah, there's somebody that said something about increasing her methadone dose, too, in the chat. That might be a beneficial. I will talk to her about that. I also see here um, as a question or for, as a comment, if anyone has suggested her uh, in-house recovery. Well, that's kind of her choice. She isn't ready to make that. You know, she's been through inpatient before and she's not ready to make that commitment yet. Yeah, I want to throw in because it sounds like uh, she's in a certain point. So I also just want to throw in and ask you the question, James. Um, have you asked her if she could, if she had a magic wand, <laughs> right? And and there were all the laws were different and methadone policies were different and everything. Sometimes I feel like that's a good, uh, and her kids wouldn't be taken away and she wouldn't lose housing, all those things. What would it look like if she had a magic wand, right? And, and then we can start to think about, okay, how do we get from where we are to to her magic wand? Uh, because there's so many barriers, right? She's not going to be able to get uh, in sober living if they don't think that taking methadone is sober. Uh, that's a huge barrier. Or if she's continuing to use illicit drugs. Um, <clears throat> so I, I think like uh, addressing it that way might be a, a good idea. And that's a good idea. I've not asked her that question yet. Sorry, David, I know you. But I will. Yeah, David, I think you wanted to add something. David Markson. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, I want to, uh, it's similar to what Wiley said, but not exactly the same. The, the comment was made when, uh, James, when you were introducing the case that uh, she's she's uh, attempted 12-step programs or looked into them, but they don't accept um, medically assisted uh, treatment. Um, I, I think that's largely true, but it's not completely true. Uh, I'm familiar with uh, an AA meeting, for example, where uh, a, a gentleman who was on methadone was a participant for quite a while. In fact, uh, I'm going to be doing a case study presentation on the 16th about uh, this gentleman. Uh, you know, the, the, the groups are, are very uh, decentralized. It's one of the uh, traditions that uh, each group is autonomous. So sure, there are a lot of individuals uh, in different groups who might say very hurtful things like, no, oh, you're not sober, you can't be here or whatever. But there are also groups that uh, where a lot of the, the people would be more uh, warm and welcoming if she were willing to try that. I can put an email address in the chat for the first things first group of Alcoholics Anonymous. If she were to send an email there, they would send her a link. It's a Zoom meeting. And I think she would find people very accepting whether she's on methadone or buprenorphine or anything else. Well, thank you. Yeah, I also um, know that there um, there have been, you know, the at the at the level of the national level for Alcoholics Anonymous, they have no no opinion. Uh, it's an outside issue. Uh, historically, uh, the the guy who invented methadone uh, was actually on the uh, AA board of directors, <laughs> right? So Bill Wilson, who started AA, brought him in, uh, and put him on the board of non-alcoholic directors and actually asked uh, and lamented that maybe uh, the world would be better if there was a, an analog of methadone for people who drank. Uh, and I think I think uh, the problem is, uh, you know, as David mentioned, there are some meetings that were very accepting. Uh, there are also, though, all I need personally as a person who is struggling is to go someplace where I was told I would be supported and to be ostracized. 
And I personally wouldn't risk somebody having to experience that in those spaces. Uh, so I know that there are anomalies and outliers, uh, but over and over and over again, uh, folks are told that they can't share uh, at the meeting until they stop using. They're told they're not welcome. They're not really sober, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I love the idea of MARA. Uh, there's also Texas Drug Users Union. Uh, there's Vocal Texas. Uh, depending on where she lives, there might be other options. Um, there's smart recovery, there's rational recovery, there's hands, which is for alcohol use uh, to help moderate it. Uh, there's moderation management groups uh, that she can attend that are online, uh, harm reduction works groups. Uh, and the good thing about the all, all of the lists that I just put out there uh, is that all of those groups are, are harm reduction and are prepared for people who are continuing to use uh, or have high rates of return to use. Um, so I, I just love, I know what we're all concerned about at the basis uh, that she has support and that she has community. Uh, and I just hate the idea of sending her into a community that, that is probably what 90% likely to reject, reject her. I felt that many times and it's not, and then she's going to lose trust in you as well because you sent her in there. Right. You know? <clears throat> so, there's... Mara is a really good thing, and the yeah. the never use alone hotline. I think that's one I'll I'll make sure to give her. Yeah, when, when, once we summarize, I'll uh, I'll go through and add some more things to what's been said. Sorry, Emily. Oh, it's okay. Um, she's twenty three, right? Twenty one. Yeah. So. Oh, twenty three. You're right. Okay, working with women that young is also very challenging, um, especially when they're not connected. And I think especially, um, I mean, everyone, but I just think that age group is so vulnerable um, in general. And so, and I don't know how old her child is. Was she recently pregnant or do you know her how long ago? Her child is one year old. So we know that whenever there's custody issues or moms have been separated from their babies due to substance use, there's a very high risk of overdose because obviously that's such a traumatic experience. Um, so I think that would want to be addressed and somebody referenced the family care portfolio. I think that's a super cool tool for women with children in vulnerable situations to have a plan when they're talking to CPS about visitation, getting their child back. But um, the other thing is uh, contraception, um, just making sure that she has thought about if she wants to get pregnant again or not, because we know that women who are using are very vulnerable. And um, that discussion is just really important because we see a lot of young women just um, have subsequent pregnancies really soon and they're not quite like stable in their recovery. So it just, it's harder for them. So addressing those those pieces, I think, is really important as well. Thank you, Imadi. I think that's very important. What type of support does she have in terms of family, relatives? Does she has a network to rely on? Well, both her father and her mother are very supportive of her, but they do live separately. So she's staying with her father, and she's in Collin County, which doesn't have a whole lot of resources. But as far as I know, she she doesn't have any other family support. She's, I believe, she's an only child. Is she currently working? Yes. I also want to put out. Uh, I appreciate everything that Emily said. Um, there's also opportunities to create a safety plan for eventual return of the child. Uh, so I think sometimes we overlook the fact that once DCS uh, is no longer involved or CPS is no longer involved, uh, that there's a high likelihood of return to use. So just being really honest about that, first of all, to mitigate some of the shame people feel, uh, particularly with pregnant women. So there have been studies that uh, there's a reduction in use right after if, if the dyad is respected, uh, there's a reduction in use after uh, the birth and then <clears throat> after about a year. Uh, there's a high risk of return. And that's probably because of oxytocin and bonding and all those things. Uh, but as was mentioned, uh, there is a high risk of return to use given uh, the removal. Uh, and um, I think sometimes we're just not real clear about, okay, if or when the child comes back home, 
there's very likely to be a return to use. What kind of safety plan? Who do we trust that we can call? How can we keep the kid as safe as possible? Because I want to say this really clearly. People who use drugs are not bad parents, right? The, the use of drugs in and of itself does not determine whether or not someone can parent uh, well. So we just want to make sure that that she knows that uh, and that there are opportunities to create um, blueprints for if this happens, then this is going to happen. We'll call this person. So-and-so will take uh, care of the baby uh, while I navigate that. Well, thank you for saying that. So it is a good practice then in that case for parents <clears throat> to use drugs, to have some contacts, some people that they trust that they can call. So the kid can be with someone, right? That's a good practice then. And I can't think of a more vulnerable, I don't know, I suppose if she was a woman of color uh, and just had a baby and had it removed and was an IV drug user, uh, that would be about the most vulnerable you could be and, and the most judged. Uh, so James, yes. it sounds like you're really showing up for her without judgment and, and that is going to go a long way. Uh, people who don't understand substance use disorder think, well, you think you'd quit for your baby. Well, you think you'd read the criteria for substance use disorder before you spout off like you're an expert. Exactly. So. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and read the summary unless somebody has something that is amazing Please. and short. <laughs> okay, go okay, with the so, summary. <laughs> yeah, I, pre <laughs> I appreciate everybody coming again. Uh, I'm gonna summarize the, the presentation as this. We can take really simple steps that prevent disease transmission and bacterial infections, even if sterile supplies aren't available in our lo locale, right? So not only can we tell people how to avoid uh, these, these conditions, we can then celebrate with them the fact that they're actually doing it, right? They can come back and be like, I stopped using the cotton out of my cigarette butt and I used a Q-tip, like you said, and whoa, that's really great. And maybe we can build a scaffolding uh, where people can scaffold up on these positive changes to a completely changed life. And when we do this, it also helps public health. Uh, some of the uh, suggestions that I heard were to keep her on methadone. Uh, and <clears throat> the reason for that is each instance that she uses that methadone, uh, she is safe from transmission, HIV, hep C, overdose, all of those things. So even if she's continuing to use illicitly, sometimes it's better to keep her on the methadone uh, sounds like the clinic's doing that. Um, a suggestion was to reduce, uh, help her to reduce the amount she's using. Uh, so again, a, a program like moderation management might be helpful for tracking that. Um, and maybe upping her methadone use. Maybe when you ask her the magic wand question, she'll say, well, the magic wand question would be if I, you know, <laughs> if I had enough methadone uh, where I didn't have to um, continue to use out of the illicit supply. Uh, someone suggested addressing her depression, of course. Um, continue to try to connect her with others in recovery, uh, particularly recovery that's open to any positive change, not just abstinence based. Uh, so there are a lot of alternatives to 12 steps, uh, depending on where she lives. Uh, harm reduction works was mentioned. Um, Texas Drug Users Union, uh, MARA, apparently you are familiar with already, uh, and opportunities for her to to to. Uh, Volunteer at harm reduction outreach would also be a really good way. Uh, so there's Vocal New York as well, uh, so she can uh, advocate for herself. <clears throat> uh, another suggestion was, you know, suggesting her changing her route of administration from injection to something that is not as uh, as dangerous, uh, and helping her to possibly find housing. Now, of course, we know the pitfalls and and the difficulties and barriers for that. Uh, given the not just illicit drug use, but even methadone can bar people from finding housing, supportive housing. Um, talked about asking if she could uh, wave a magic wand. Um, we talked about the increase of likelihood for overdose, given the removal of her child, uh, having a plan when talking to CPS, uh, making sure there's contraception available, and having a safety plan um, for the possible uh, reunification uh, with her child. And the last thing is, I, you know, I would, personally, I would congratulate her on having a, a high recovery capital. Uh, I would congratulate her on staying alive as long as she stayed alive. I would congratulate her on um, navigating probably one of the most difficult situations any of us could possibly imagine. Um, 
And and I think if we focus on those and then give her any of these hundreds of small positive changes, uh, sh then that self-esteem can be built up. Uh, and it's it's pretty amazing what happens when people start to to gather a bunch of um, examples of where they're making their life better, given the gravity of the situation and, and the rest of their life. Did I miss anything that someone wants me to add before we end? I think you summarized it pretty <clears throat> well. <laughs> I think we're good. Well, I want to thank again all of you for being here today. And remember, our next session is going to be next month. Always Home Productions happens on the first Thursday of every month. So we'll see you all there. Thank you again. And remember to answer the survey. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody.